Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia Success Podcast, where we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. On this show, I work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. This week, I talked to Dr. Angela Edwards about her career in academic medicine. We discuss her leadership in local and national societies, as well as some of the surprising career twists and turns that she's taken. We also talk about how she has intentionally invested in her marriage and her family when her work has been crazy, and she herself is married to a physician, as her husband is a vascular surgeon. And we also talk about some of the financial decisions that she's made, to which she attributes her family's financial success. As always, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to episode 31 of the Anesthesia Success Podcast. This week, I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Angela Edwards. Angie is the current president of the Society for Perioperative Assessment and Quality Improvement, as well as an associate professor and section head of perioperative medicine in the Department of Anesthesiology at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Angie, thanks a lot for being with me today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. And to start off, I like to just dive in with an interesting story or fun fact or something. So, you know, we were talking before this recording. I'm curious to know the craziest clinical situation that you've ever found yourself in as an anesthesiologist. Oh, this is a good one. So, um, you know, I had a chance to think about this before we got online um, to chat. And and there have been many. There have been, I think, in throughout the last, you know, 20 years in my career, there've been several cases that stick with me. But when you said the craziest, I had to attach um, a little piece of my personal life to this. So my um, full disclosure, my, my husband's a surgeon. And early in my career, probably the first five to six years out, I was predominantly a vascular anesthesiologist. Um, my husband's a vascular surgeon, and we did not overlap on cases until this particular request. And, um, you know, we're sitting, I was sitting in my office one day and he asked, he called, he said, Hey, I need you to do this case for me tomorrow. Can you, I've got a couple of meetings coming up at noon. I need you to just kind of get me in and out really straightforward case. It's a triple a open infrarenal cross clamp, straightforward, otherwise really, really healthy tree farmer who has no other medical problems. And I'm thinking, uh, you always look at this through a, through a different lens when a surgeon says this to you, even though it was my husband. Right. And I said, you know, we have a couple things we have to do. One, you, we've got to, you know, ask the patient if he's okay with that full disclosure. And two, I said, let me look a little closer at this case. Um, and he said, oh, oh, don't worry about it. He's in pre-op clinic right now. He's being seen one of your, one of your colleagues. He's coming in and he's going to spend the night here in a hotel. He's, he'll, he's fine. So I look further into this. Turns out this patient has four plus mitral grade regurg. And, and for, the, for those who are not familiar, that's pretty significant mm-hmm. issue when you're talking about an open um, AAA aortic cross clamp. And of course, the surgeon says, and from this point on, I'll refer to him, I'll refer to him as the surgeon, <laughs> um, said, you know, you know, it's just simple, straightforward infrarenal cross clamp. Well, so I thought, okay, well, well, we'll see how this goes. So I go down and see the patient pre-op, get all the information I need, set everything up, and turns out I need an intraoperative echo, th- mm. thoracic epidural, mm. talk to the patient. He's great with it in the holding room. I have everything set up. And I will tell you, during the course of that, the next two and a half hours, it went from straightforward to complex mm. to complicated to disastrous to a great outcome. So it turned out for those in anesthesia who really want to know and are curious, it was a, it went from infrarenal to supra celiac cross clamp in a matter of just a couple of minutes um, with unanticipated blood loss. Um, but with thankfully with an intraoperative echo and thoracic epidural post-op, this um, lovely gentleman was extubated on the table, did great in the ICU, saw him that night, and he was up eating breakfast the next morning and out wow. the door within three days. So um, that's a, that's a, but that one was, uh, I, I can't make this up. April first, two thousand seven. Wow. <laughs> Those things stay with you over time, um, and you know, you know, a couple of uh, dinners later and a few conversations put the marriage back together. We were all good. <laughs> We were all good after that. And so, you know, wow. we just celebrated our 20th, uh, 22nd wedding anniversary. And after 20 years, you don't, you don't <laughs> count as much. Wow. But, you know, it, so it, it's, it was a unique experience. And I think probably one of the take home points with that was, you know, when you, um, when you have a, a dual physician um, marriage, there are, there are 
inherent issues there. And then when you cross talk professionally and you overlap professionally, there are issues there. And then the third piece of that was when, you know, when it came to the folks that we were working with in the operating room, my observation of their interactions and their perceptions, mm -hmm. we have, had to be mindful of how, of their comfort level because yeah. they were so um, intricately involved in the success of the endpoint of that case. Yeah. So, you know, it, all, all said, it went very well, um, and everyone left the room quite happy, and, and, and I will say entertained for those of us uh, <laughs> at home that know us, <laughs> but that by far is probably the most um, the, the most like, sort of the most exciting case I've had in quite a long time. Wow. I'm curious, you know, being married to a vascular surgeon, do you find that, and obviously, you know, if, if you get all the anesthesi anesthesiologists together, you know, you, you like sidle up to the bar at the ASA meeting and everyone's telling the stories about the surgeons that they have to deal with. I'm curious, you know, you being married to a surgeon, does that, does that inform the way that you interact with other surgeons or vice versa? I'm, I'm sure you're obviously more sensitive to the types of issues and in interacting in the OR uh, with the surgeon just because you're married to one. You know, it's it's interesting. It, I think it it works in it, globally, not just with surgeons in the OR, but also with the nursing staff yeah. um, and all the support staff. My interactions with the surgeons, I think, early on, it was a little challenging as a woman in medicine and an anesthesiologist. Sometimes that that uh, colors the glasses a little bit. Mm -hmm. So people may see you and have a perception of you that is different than what you actually are. So you have to be careful of that baseline. Right. Um, and, and then when I see these folks out in social settings over the, over the last 20 years, it's, it's softened a little bit, but I think for, initially it was difficult. It was very difficult. And yeah. There were things you had to be mindful of when you, um, when you went into the room, when you talked about the case the night before, when you were in the moment in those cases, you had to be very, very careful of the language mm -hmm. and, and the tone that was used. Yeah. Cause yeah. you, well, the benefit is you keep friends afterwards and that's the right. goal. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so you've been doing this for 20 years now down at Wake. You just said yeah. happy anniversary, upcoming anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you have not only, you know, local leadership there, but also nationally with SPACI. So why don't you just give us a, an overview of your current, uh, responsibilities, both clinically and leadership wise. Okay, currently. So um, I have been um, blessed with many opportunities, both with the Society for Perioperative Medicine and Quality Improvement, SPACI. Um, and you can look us up online, um, just Google SPACI, we come right up. Uh, this is a, actually a, a group of colleagues, sort of an interdisciplinary um, multi disciplinary network of, of team members who are interested in preoperative evaluation, sort of perioperative medical management and optimization of patients before surgery. And so I started as the secretary treasurer about six years ago and sort of gradually worked my way up towards president just in, in sort of a service line, really. Um, I was passionate about this area, was working in the pre-op clinic when I started as a secretary treasurer and found that, um, quite frankly, networking with people outside my own institution and connecting with um, people who were like-minded and had similar interests was invigorating and, um, quite frankly, professionally sustaining. There were, is a lot to be learned from people who are doing things outside and different, both academic and pri in the private sector in this space. And it's not just physicians, um, anesthesiologists, hospitalists, internal medicine physicians. Everyone comes at this um, same, with the same um, project with a sort of a different perspective. Yeah. So we're all trained um, differently. We come at things with a different um, perspective and, and work in different areas. So whereas mine, I may look at preoperative assessment from um, sort of with an intraoperative lens, looking, looking backwards and also looking from the ambulatory perspective, I, I kind of also work with my intraoperative, right, my uh, internal medicine members who look at it from the ambul ambulatory perspective. So we do a lot of work together. It's been great. Um, I'm also um, our anesthesia champion for enhanced recovery after anesthesia at Wake. I've been doing that for the last two years. Um, also providing lectures to medical students. I'm on a few review boards and educational subcommittees for the ASA. 
I've worked with the IRS and um, the um, EBPOM, which is the evidence-based perioperative medicine group, um, and also APSF. So doing starting out um, in, pre in the pre-op clinic and working with SPACI has really opened doors to other opportunities. Um, you know, in the last two years, I've had some international speaking engagements, um, both with the, the uh, Asian and Australasian Congress of Anesthesiologists um, last year in Beijing. And like I said, the IRS and the, there's an international scientific symposium that also um, is on sort of the side of the planet, the Chinese with the uh, Chinese Society of Anesthesiology. So okay. there's a, there have been a lot of doors that have just opened from simply starting as the medical director of the pre-op clinic. So if we look back about uh, six, seven years ago. Um, I started as um, just a project for our, of our institution. We uh, was pro approached by our um, um, uh, clinical director of operations who said, you know, we've got this problem down in our pre-op clinic and we probably need somebody to work on that for a little bit. Would you be interested? And I initially said, no, I would not be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would not. I'm, I'm really happy working in the OR and I don't, I'm not ready to to leave the OR just yet. And, and he said, well, you know, think about it and, and let me know what you would need to do that. Well, they're, they're by, you know, the sort of the operative phrase, what do you need to make that happen? Yeah. And so I kept, I, I eventually said yes when I went down and took In a In other look. words, give me a well, number. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, you'd think so, but, um, you know, my motivation um, was driven more by projects. You yeah. know, like I, like I said before we, um, when we were talking earlier that, you know, anesthesiologists thrive on change. I think what drives us and what keeps us inspired is that there's no day that is ever the same. Um, it's always different. You might be in a different location, different hospital. Certainly the cases are different. The patients are different. The surgeons are different. We thrive on change. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this was an opportunity for change. This was an opportunity for a project and to improve something for patient care. So there, that was my motivation. Um, and you know, then, then again, I needed to ask for resources. Okay. Who's my team? Who's going to help me with this? And I was fortunate. There was a well-established team, um, in our pre-op clinic. Uh, we just needed more of a clinical direction. So mm -hmm. I took on that role, but again, I kept sort of 50, 50. I wasn't ready to leave the OR yet. And I was, you know, I'm still not 20 years into this. I'm still not. Um, now, at that point, how long had you been doing OR anesthesia? Um, a solid somewhere between three and five years. Cause I was also down in the pre-op clinic, maybe one day a week. Okay. So it was, a, I had a little bit of time everywhere. So okay. that, and that's about right. So somewhere between I, and this is just, you know, my general theory, somewhere between about years three and six, your career's going to take a shift mm -hmm. at some point somewhere. It seems like most anesthesiologists, who are predominantly clinical in the OR and, and whether you're academic or private, you'll be asked by your colleagues to take on a leadership role. Here's a project. We'd like you to take a look at this, look at this through a different lens and lend us and, and tell us what you would do with this. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, it happens to everybody, even the folks that are finishing now who are in kind of that, you know, three to five year window of post-residency. Um, and if you're lucky, you get that much time yeah, <laughs> to yeah. actually to, to, to uh, um, hone your craft and get comfortable in the OR. So when I moved into the pre-op clinic, that's when I was introduced to um, the group with the Perioperative Medicine Summit, which at the time was an independent entity out of the Cleveland Clinic and University of Miami, a group of internal medicine and hospital physicians who um, put this meeting together. And so my first one I, I went to, it just was awestruck by all the information that we could take back home and began to sort of gradually make some changes and, and improve our processes for managing patients in the preoperative sector. So be well before surgery. Okay. And that has to do with anything from medical management, but just the basics. Yeah. Of, At that of, summit, yeah. what are the, is there other anesthesiologists involved? Or is it mostly other specialties? Oh, it's abs absolutely. You've got anesthesiologists, hospitalists, internal medicine physicians, um, advanced practice providers. So okay. we have uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners who are actually sometimes independently running their own pre-op clinics and very likely out in the um, private sector because just because they're not as well resourced mm -hmm. as, as we are in academics. So it, it is a, we have national experts. Actually, I think one of the speakers you're getting ready to have on is coming out to the summit. You can ask him about that. Okay, um, um, in in March, our our meeting is in March, and you can go online and uh, just again just simply Google Perioperative Medicine Summit. will come right up. Um, and our program is usually designed for 
um, the preoperative or perioperative medicine specialist, we try and make it applicable to both anesthesiologists and internal medicine physicians who are working in that space so that it's, it is a balanced multidisciplinary program. Mm-hmm. Again, we, it gives us an opportunity to share information and crosstalk and provides internal medicine physicians, I think, with the ability to understand what happens in the anesthesia world, sort of what happens in that intraoperative box, which for places who are who have pre-op clinics that are run by medicine physicians, it, it helps our intraoperative colleagues across the across the country um, have better preoperative workups. Sure. And so we have that piece of it. And at the same time, we learn a lot from our internal medicine colleagues. So it's a balanced approach. Makes perfect sense. And so talk a little bit about, you know, in the different, uh, different, I guess, uh, operative models, uh, what is the role of a, a pre-op clinic? Uh, and what are the sort of, what are the other alternatives there where you're taking a perioperative sort of, it sounds like kind of like a beginning to end sort of a, a holistic, trying to get a high level view, uh, and then optimizing all the different parts of right. the process along the way, rather than um, I mean, I guess I'm interested to know what are the alternatives to what you're doing? How are others doing who aren't doing it this way? So those who don't have a pre-op clinic is kind of what you want to see. You yeah. know, if, it, if you don't have the ability for the staffing and the location um, or the, uh, the physical setup, what do you do? And quite frankly, I, I do wonder about my colleagues who don't have pre-op clinics, how they navigate getting their patients ready for surgery. There, there are, in, we've entered a world of telemedicine where there's a lot we can do remotely. And just like you and I are talking um, now, we could pick up the phone and call a patient and ask a series of questions to get a basic understanding of where they are at present. Um, and a lot of places do that. Um, I think, you know, even, even maybe where you are up in the Northeast, there's several places that do not have established pre-op clinics. They might outsource this work to the primary care physicians. Mm-hmm. They could easily do, and then in your pre-op, your pre-anesthesia workup is actually done in the holding room just minutes before you see your patient. And the consent is done at the same time. You know, I've, I've, and I'm biased, so let me just let me just preface everything I'm about to say with that <laughs> statement. Um, I I think it's very difficult to do a pre-op, an effective pre-op workup in the holding room before surgery. One, you don't get effective consent. I think that's pressured, and the yeah. patients are simply they don't cannot possibly process any of the information that's being brought towards them. I think you know they're lucky if they hear a little bit of the detail about a, about a regional anesthetic. But in terms of getting true informed consent, I think that is a strained opportunity. So. I we totally talk a agree. Lot. We talk <laughs> a lot about patient on that yeah. side like, a couple times. I remember like sitting there in my gown, getting ready to sign a form, thinking like, "Well, I'm here. They've right. drawn. They've drawn on my arm with the sharpie. Right. I'm getting ready to get rolled in. You're telling me that I have an option to not sign this thing and then go home. That that just seems weird to me. It's it was right. a little disjointed. Right, right. And so you don't have it. It eliminates an opportunity for conversations with patients. And, you know, you being young and healthy, think about it if you're, you know, 85 to 90, or you're taking your grandmother in and she, he or she can't process the information. You've there, there could be, you know, other issues to address sort of advanced care directives to address. Mm -hmm. So the pre-op clinics are really designed as an opportunity to engage in both medical optimization and shared decision-making. So that's, that's a big buzzword in our, in our world of, of providing information to a patient about their risks, about their current status, what you can do to change their medical, um, medical optimization or their degree of readiness for the surgery. And there's a, there's a whole school of thought out there on prehabilitation. Like, you know, we talk about rehabilitation after surgery, but there's a prehabilitation beforehand that you can do to, to get people ready and to optimize their physical status. And then, by the way, have a conversation of, are we doing the right surgery at the right time for the right purpose on the right patient? You know, there's a whole lot of conversation and that takes time. We don't, in five minutes in a, in the pre-op holding room, I don't have that time sure. and certainly don't feel like I can devote the time to patients. So, you know, I, I, what our colleagues are doing is hopefully getting on the phone with patients ahead of time or having some pre-screening done on the phone. Yeah. Um, and hopefully educating their primary care providers, um, on, on some of these issues that need to be addressed ahead of time. So you mentioned telemedicine and it's interesting I'm, as I'm sort of playing this through in my mind, I think this feels like a, you know, there are some places where telemedicine is like a little bit tough. Like no one's ever going to receive general anesthesia through an iPad, but there are some (laughs) parts of the process that where this seems optimal. And and frankly, I think the pre-op clinic sounds like, well, this is like a no brainer. Uh, I'm curious to know how has the telemedicine revolution that's sort of ongoing, how, how does that factor into this equation? 
So it, it, I'm glad you asked. There are several um, mechanisms that you can put into place to, to ease that pre-op process in terms of time. Um, and, and the old fashioned way is just to pick up the phone and have um, a series of questions that maybe a nurse or who's well-versed in pre-op or pre-surgical care can ask a patient to get an idea of, you know, basic comorbidities, allergies, if they've ever had any problems with surgery, anesthesia, and go through a basic review of systems to figure out if they need to physically come in and be seen. And we've been, uh, we have the benefit of having that here at, at Wake, where we have um, several nurses who pick up the phone and make those phone calls. That's not necessarily telemedicine, but that is sort of a, that's a mechanism that almost all of our patients have. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is that everybody sort of carries their cell phone around. That phone call might take 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes once you get somebody on the phone. And that is a way of triaging patients to, you know, whether or not they actually need to come in or whether or not they can just go back to their PC primary care provider and yeah. see and see them to get something um, taken care of. And in some instances, they actually need to come in to be seen. Now, the telemedicine piece, that's the, in terms of your your physical assessment, the piece that's lacking is the ability to do a physical exam preoperatively. Mm -hmm. So we just don't have a good mechanism in place to listen to heart and lungs and, yeah. and, and assess, you know, we could do a video chat, we could do that. And that would give us enough of what, of what we can see. Um, and we could have someone, you know, potentially do part of our physical exam for us, but to be able to actually, you know, auscultate what you need to and listen to what you need to, we don't, we don't have a good mechanism for that. So there are a few pieces that are still missing. Um, and again, it has to do with your institution's bandwidth and whether or not you've got, um, with, with the time you have and resources to put personnel in place to do those, um, to serve those roles. Yeah. So in terms of pre-op, that's where we live. Now, if right. you talk in terms of an the anesthesia world, we're getting into more um, more automated systems and, and artificial intelligence, right. and that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Perhaps a uh, fodder for a future episode. Right, right. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you mentioned this is a, an intra or interspecialty consortium, essentially, SPACI. Yeah. So maybe give us a couple examples so we can get a little bit of a flavor of what are, what are some of the interspecialty dialogues that are happening? What types of issues are you addressing? And how does that external perspective uh, help bring light even either between specialties or even from, between like uh, physicians and other sort of strata in the care provider totem pole? Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. So the, um, and I, I can just run through some of the topics. We, we have our planning committee for the summit um, does a nice job of this. We sort of have this open dialogue between our internal medicine colleagues and anesthesiologists on the committee that we'll talk about. So what is the latest in evidence-based care um, that's coming out? You can actually, as, as a sidebar, you can actually follow a lot of our conversations on Twitter. Okay. Um, you can find me on Twitter, um, AF Edward MD. That's sort of, I'm there everywhere. You can also follow Spacky. It's, um, I, set, I set the Spacky handle up before I really knew anything about Twitter. So... <laughs> But that's my disclaimer. Um, when I was too young to really know anything about Twitter, yep. so the Spacky handle is at Spacky Edu, and we'll, you'll see a lot of our conversations back and forth on that. And and there's also you know it's the Spacky account will retweet some things that might come up at different meetings. And so we talk about specific topics. Let's talk about you know just simply medical you know ma ma management of medications preoperatively. There's a lot of dialogue about what to do with antihypertensives, antipsychotics, you know antidepressants. Um, Bridging therapy is always a big topic. What to do with these anticoagulants? So we've got our ASRA guidelines and we've mm -hmm. got um, um, clear guidelines for, you know, preoperative management, depending upon what our anesthetic plan is going to uh, involve. Um, and and our, our anesthesia, our intermedicine colleagues may not be as aware of that because they may not be aware of what the, what the intraoperative plan would be for a certain uh, surgical case. And so because, again, because we live in the intraoperative space, mm -hmm. um, we have the have an opportunity to discuss why we might choose to do a thoracic epidural or a peripheral nerve block with with or without a combined general anesthetic. Um, and there's a lot of overlap in terms of, of those conversations. We've, it, depending upon what paper has come out when, mm -hmm. one of the most recent conversations over the course of the last 18 months has involved the METS trial that came out in Lancet in uh, 2018 that it will change the way we um, 
deal with uh, cardiac patients prior to non-cardiac surgery. I think we're hopeful mm-hmm. for a new set of ACCHA guidelines coming out because that branch point of physical activity was changed by what came out in that METS trial. So we have a lot of ongoing dialogue about um, current evidence, um, recent publications, and how that impacts our preoperative management to really get ready for the intraoperative plan. Okay. So I, I saw the statistic recently, and I'm sure you're probably familiar with it because this is pretty renowned in the uh, in the academic medicine world. Is that it's there's about a 17 year lag between the time that uh, you know a white paper shows conclusively that on an evidence based oh, perspective, yeah. here's how things should be done, to the time that it actually takes to implement institutionally. So I'm curious, you know, you're this is a perfect, I think, uh, landscape for this. You know, it, it's important to figure out the best way, the most optimal path for a patient, the safest, and, and then to quickly, as quickly as you reasonably can, implement things that seem like they make sense. So can you talk a little bit about how do you try to take that 17 year gap and perhaps shorten it a bit? Oh, I, I love this. This actually goes into the Twitter med ed conversation. Is, mm-hmm. that, is that where you want me to take this? Yeah, I, we can. And by the way, so anybody who's interested, all the, refer- all the um, resources that Angie's referencing, Twitter handles, websites, et cetera, that'll all be available on the show notes, anesthesiasuccess.com slash 31. So go there and we'll, we'll have a list of all the resources discussed here. So yeah, go ahead and, and tackle that for us, Angie. So, so a lot of, you know, what you mentioned in terms of, you know, publications, the peer reviewed publications, by the time they actually get out into the literature, if you're, if you're one of those people that follows um, two or three journals, you might see it, it might catch your eye, but then it's in PubMed and it sits there until somebody references it again. Right. I've had papers that I wrote back in 2003 that still have have really yet to be re-referenced. Whereas with this new, with sort of the new social media platforms, with Twitter and the, the sort of the hashtag meted conversations that are ongoing and, and these Twitter feeds and what, what are called tutorials that come out, you've got more of an opportunity to learn what's out there, the latest in the literature, someone will tweet out something in a paper. I mean, I can say that I have been in an elevator and probably read two or three papers before I hit the ninth floor of my office. And it, wow. I would, in a journal that I would have never covered. So my, you know, my colleagues in SPACI may be reading different journals. I, they don't read a and They don't, re- they may not catch BGA, but they will all, but they'll be certain to read, you know, Society of Hospital Medicine Literature or um, uh, JAMA and maybe tweet something out. And so on that platform or, or mention something in a meeting. And that's very typically where we get it at the, at the summit. Yeah. The, that platform has enabled us to, to rapidly share and disseminate the latest in evidence-based um, perioperative care and what's coming out in, in the literature much faster than I would ever find it on PubMed or that I would ever find it otherwise. So uh, again, this Twitter crosstalk in medical education um, in through that through that platform has been fantastic. And I think there's other there are other platforms I've seen more on Instagram lately, but that's yeah. sort of the where where we're living now. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a I would say it's a love hate relationship with Twitter. It's more like a <laughs> frustration and skepticism. And like, I don't really understand it. And I feel like there's a lot that can go wrong and it doesn't add much to my life. <laughs> so why don't you just give us like your best 60 seconds on, you know, the physicians out there who are like, I don't do social because it could get me fired, but it's not going to make my job better. So it's all downside, no upside. Why should I have a Twitter handle? Why should I be involved in that conversation? Oh my gosh. Wow. That's how that's, I feel about it. So just that's like, that's convince like me right episode. now, Angie. That's a whole episode in and of itself. I will yeah. say that, that have it, you have to manage it like anything else. You have to manage what comes comes across your feed. So, you know, the first thing you do is when you set up your Twiddle handle, you figure out what's the purpose, why am I going to get on this platform? And I wanted to see what my colleagues were reading, what they were, I wanted to follow certain people and follow certain conversations. So that hashtag conversation or the little at symbol with um, the the people you're following. I wanted to know what, what is everyone else talking about? It's more the medical education and that's that which is directly pertinent to my practice. Mm-hmm. So I would follow anesthesia journals. I would follow medicine journals and whatever's coming out in the literature. And I found that to be quite frankly, refreshing. And I didn't pick it up right before bed. I made sure that I, you know, again, like anything else, you have to manage it and make certain that, you know, you do have to take a look at it maybe once a day for a few minutes, but that's it. It does not need to be all encompassing. Um, I have encountered a few trolls and a few bots in different conversations and they quickly get deleted. Thank you so much. I don't really want to have you part of my conversation. Um, And, you know, occasionally I'll get sucked into a conversation, um, uh, some Twitter feed where someone's (laughs) talking about, and we've uh, very careful and be very respectful of each other's yeah. um, 
uh, perspectives on the literature as people are tweeting out their thoughts. But it's almost like an online journal club. So I'll I'll mm. use it in that um, in 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 that regard, just to make certain that I stay up to date, mm -hmm. and just to read the literature for myself. What I love is when people actually will tweet out the paper itself, so I can actually look at the direct. Um, with the, what the literature has said, rather than sort through, you know, having to sort through another another platform. So I think in that regard, it's helpful, yeah. but you have to be careful yeah, because um, you can find that what you say is, again, it's being mindful of what you say and, and how you put it out there and how often you put it out there because you can completely overwhelm someone's Twitter feed where if you're putting something out there twice a day, it's just, it's, I, in my opinion, that might be something that I pause on. Okay, I, that's a little bit too much. Yep. But yep. Um, every now and then, I think it's it's helpful to our professional development. And so mm -hmm. you'll find that if you're a regional anesthesiologist or if you're pain, um, pain medicine, acute pain physician, that you might want to follow certain journals and then mm -hmm. you'll find people will come. You just, it's a way to connect and enhance your professional development i think so yeah. i view it as a positive but again it's a tool that has to be managed sure and i know i think it was dr ed mariano who we sort of referenced earlier was it him that he had sort of a brief like here's how you use social for physicians for anybody who's kind of like interested in dipping a toe in the water and hasn't yet achieved comfort in the Twitter Absol sphere right uh, right I'll, I'll try to find that and we can put it in the show notes I think that it is great. Ed does a great job of um, Twitter education. There are several, and I've got a couple of friends, actually, if you wanted to follow them, I could share that too in your yeah, show sure. notes. Yeah, sure. They've got great tutorials out there on how to use Twitter, how to make it um, such that it's a professional development tool, and it's a way to connect with people who you might other, not, not otherwise encounter. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. I had was following the conversation of a few folks um, from the ASA, and that's typically how I start. I started with a meeting, followed the meeting conversation. And so the whole reason I got on Twitter was with the ASA say a couple of years ago, I started following the conversation and found that I could be aware of um, certain things that were going on in different parts of the meeting, it, maybe sessions I was unable to attend because I was at another session. And mm -hmm. I felt like I was also able to engage with highlights of the session I wanted to be in, but was busy with another one at the same time. So I didn't miss anything. Yeah. Um, and that's the benefit of, of Twitter at, at a lot of these uh, professional meetings and then staying connected with the same people afterwards. And so I digress briefly, but I, I was following some folks after one of the ASA meetings and happened to literally physically finally run into someone at, at the IRS meeting a couple of years years later. And it was really funny. We'd been dialoguing online for yeah. so many years on this social media platform, but yet had not physically met in person. So it was a little backwards. You know, normally we meet somebody, we talk, we have a conversation and then we might dialogue and interact over email and mm -hmm. work on a project together that way. Well, this was worked entirely the opposite direction of, yeah. we met on Twitter, talked, had some crosstalk on Twitter, um, had some, um, another dialogue on email and then finally met in person. So again, it's just a different way of, of connecting, meeting people and staying professionally engaged yeah. and expanding your network. I guess that's if, if I had one thing to say about it, use it as a tool to expand your network. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Uh, cool. Well, I'm going to check out those resources and <laughs> maybe try to do a little better with my, with my Twitter. <laughs> Oh, gosh, it just, just it, stress, clean it, up a it stresses bit. me out though, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see if I can get there. Well, we'll see if we can't share and expand your network a little bit this way. You'll, you'll have a good time with it. I mean, it. honestly, I do, I, I do, I mostly use it as like a curated sort of news feed because I like to see not as much the clinical stuff, but what are the things that people in anesthesia and pain are talking about? What are the issues um, from like, especially from like a business, career, financial, economic um, industry impact, insurance, all those types of things. Cause that's very helpful, obviously for me and my practice and helping to, you know, help my clients make informed decisions about their own lives. Um, but, but as far as the interaction, that's where I sort of get, tri get tripped up. And I think you, you know, I'll, I'll send you some links. There's, um, there's the, I started with, um, actually women in anesthesiology, which is mm -hmm. at women MD in, um, anesthesia, it's A N E S T H. They started with a basic Twitter feed and a way to stay connected. And then there's several academic and private um, programs across the country who are, believe it or not, are on Twitter. I think the medical community has decided this may be a platform for use yeah. um, just to stay connected. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Cool. 
Um, okay, I want to pivot a little bit here. Uh, there's there's so many interesting things that we can talk about here, Angie, and I, I want to take a minute and and talk about uh, what it's like to be in a, a dual physician household. Your husband, you said, is a surgeon. You've got some kids. Mm-hmm. It sounds like everybody's doing well and you, you're maintaining sanity. But I'm curious. You know, I'm so my wife is a resident. Uh, I uh, I'm not a physician, but I'm a you know a business owner, and so I'm we're both very busy. We're expecting our first kid here in December, which we're really excited about. Oh, but frankly, I'm I'm kind of intimidated <laughs> as I look at the next <laughs> three to five to seven years, and we maybe there might be other kids. There's yeah, going to be yeah. probably you know job changes, maybe like geographic. Moves oh yeah, changes good. Yep. Um, change. And I'm thinking, how the heck do you keep it on the rails? So I'm curious, how was that? How did that play out for you? And oh your my gosh, 20 years. So sum- summarize 20 years in less than two minutes. Or maybe um, just take the first like five <laughs> or seven years of that and just. You know, I'll, I'll take it in five year chunks. So yeah. I, the way I look at it, you know, we. Um, we um, we were married in the middle of residency and thought initially the plan would be to have children after residency and start our family at that time. Well, um, our first came, I guess I was an intern and a little unexpected, (laughs) uh, challenging to navigate, but we took one day, one month at a time and, and outsourced as much as I could, as much as was reasonable. And this may run counter to your financial conversations, but this was key to our sanity and our ability to to function and quite frankly, stay married. Yeah. Um, That is important. And your right. money should serve that purpose all <laughs> the time. Should, so. Right. And so this was hard for me to get my head around initially because I'm a saver. Yeah. And so the whole concept of outsourcing and spending money on things and people to do things for me was hard for me to get my head around. Yeah. But I think if I had if I had to say anything, the key to success was learning to outsource. So we had um, I had nannies help me through and the craziest things we had nannies help us during the day. We had daycare at the same time. Um, for the first five years for my son. And then my daughter came along. And mm. so I had both. He was in school. We, we had nannies at the same time. It The numbers would blow your mind if I had mm. to run through it with you. <laughs> um, but it was the way to make, to get through and to survive yeah. and to, and to thrive at the same time that we were navigating a, a, an early por- portion of our career, starting out the first five years in practice. And he finished, my husband actually finished his vascular surgery fellowship and then went on to do a master's program okay. and did two years in the lab at the same time. So that helped. So he pivoted his career a little bit. So, and so that we could balance a little better and make yeah. sure that we had plenty of time at home with our children while I was in the midst of so much change and, and getting my practice up and running, getting comfortable in the OR. So the first five years, um, and this may not, this may again run counter to your, your, your theory on anesthesia success, but we, we spent money to help us thrive in the midst of all that. Yeah. And outsourced. The next couple of years, we spent a lot of money on our children, you know, watching yeah. our children grow and, and getting help where we needed it um, to, again, you know, be able to continue growing in our careers. My husband didn't travel as much as I did in terms of meetings and speaking over the next um, that, that following 10 years. Um, but again, we kept the same base. We always had help at home and lots of help at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the hard thing to find. I find that one of the biggest questions I had people asking me coming along is how do you find your nannies? How do you find your home help? How, and honestly, it was just talking to people and online networking. I think there's so many websites now you can go to to find people that fit and actually understand a two-physician family. The lifestyle yeah. that we live is very different than most people. We don't come home at five. Right. Um, and that's very hard for someone who's going to help you to understand that we don't know when we're coming home and we're where we, I will let you know as soon as I can, but yeah. I, I, I need you to be flexible and I will pay you to do so. Right. And, and then, you know, it's, so it's a, it's an interesting relationship. Um, and it's a very different relationship for my husband with the nannies and the home help and me, um, with that, with that, that group, it was, um, but it was the key to our success. Yeah. Um, I will say my kids have a funny story about the whole thing and the way their perspective is, but my son who has now started his first year in college seems to be thriving and has done quite well with it. Um, my daughter who came along behind, who was used to a, a house full, um, with, with some of the help that we had at home and mm-hmm. my son and all his friends, um, who started high school now is actually happy to have the quiet. Yeah. We've not entered a new phase. Um, yeah. so I think, you know, between the two of us, we balanced call schedules mm-hmm. and I will say balance is 
a little oxymoronic. It's not really balance. It is, <laughs> it is again, you got to pause and pivot and decide who's going to be taking a heavy load and who's going to go part-time. I actually went 75% clinical um, and cut my workload a little bit a few years ago okay. in order to have some more office time, to have some more flexibility because, you know, you leave the house at, you know, 5.30 or 6 o'clock, depending upon whatever you're doing and how far you are from home and you yeah. don't see your kids get on the school bus. Um, and that can be hard on the kids. So yeah. it, there may be an opportunity opportunity to pivot if you're both if you both have that type of schedule um but the whole success i think to it goes back to my theory that i think i shared with you earlier is that you know throughout your profession you're going to have to at some point pause um pivot a little bit and decide you know which direction am, am, am i going in the correct direction is this the right path both for me professionally personally for my family yeah. um and if it's not how do I adapt and how do I make the change so that it is? And then, you know, at the same time, you got to be feeding your passions and, and, and amplifying your strengths so that you feel professionally fulfilled and you're doing the right thing because you've invested a lot of time in this, in this process to, mm -hmm. you know, go through medical school, go through residency fellowship um, and start your practice in the first five years that that's way too much time invested to simply stop. Totally. And yeah. honestly, I think it's based on what you just described. It sounds like you showed an incredible amount of wisdom as a, a young physician married to another young physician when you're not making a ton of money yet, but still investing your money. And when I say investing, I mean spending yeah. in this context <laughs> in, in a way that's going to make your life better uh, and or even bearable. And, you know, yeah, you, you were yeah. sort of joking about, you know, how I would think about like spending versus saving or whatever. But I'm a proponent of spend money in ways that make your life awesome. And there you get, hit a point of diminishing returns. Right, right. Where right. You have to be additional <laughs> additional expenditure doesn't make your life better, but to a certain right. extent, like if you're working 70, 80 plus hours a week and three or five hundred dollars a month on somebody to clean your house and paying for childcare is yeah. is sort of necessary for you to maintain sanity, then that is the best money you're gonna spend every month. And I it would is. absolutely say, you know, yes and amen to that. No question. Yeah, it, it was the it was the key to our ability to make it work. Um, and it didn't we, we had to balance that though with making sure we spent enough time with our children yeah. over the course of, you know, their their early years, the middle years, which I will tell you is a is a whole different ball game. And then um, and then getting them off to their the next phase of their life. But I will say to your point in most of your podcasts, we did do the very smart thing and that's um, save and hide money from from what we saw coming into our bank account each yep. month, such that you know we are comfortable and in a really good place in terms of you know retirement funding and saving for our children's education. Those were we. we I'm blessed to have a partner in life that shared the same um, school of thought on that. That you know that was that was key to my ability to be comfortable was knowing that we had all of that taken care of. The kids were taken care of, and whatever we had left over, we could use to to pad our lifestyle such that we could function sure. and pay the nannies, pay the housekeepers, all this stuff. So yeah. not that we had a tremendous amount and certainly didn't um, um, at various stages because uh, depending upon, you know, it, over the course of years, people change, they need different things. And so yeah. we've had a few folks in our lives. We've not been blessed to have the same person for it for the last 20, uh, 15, 20 years, but, but it is, it is, it is a worthwhile investment. Yeah. And so maybe talk a little bit about sort of the financial part of your journey, because obviously as a, as a physician, you kind of go through these phases, same as with family life, um, where the front end and the middle and the, you know, established attending hood all look pretty different. So how did you and your husband communicate about that? Establish like, here's our values and goals. Here's, here's what we want to prioritize. Here's the place we're going to spend when we don't have a lot to spend. And then once money becomes a little more abundant, how do you, how have you guys sort of navigated that discussion? <laughs> that that's that's a great conversation so we um w w again i'm blessed we kind of grew came from the same school of thought that we had long-term goals the short-term goal was to get rid of as much school debt as we possibly could as quickly as we could so we didn't go out and buy the big house we didn't go out and buy new cars we kept what we had for as long as we um and what was safe um i embraced the minivan i have to tell you i yeah. did i i loved i've heard you i've heard a previous guest talk about the minivan yeah and, and, and that's my, your friend dr turner i believe oh yeah yeah i love my minivan i have to tell you my friends made fun of me and my kids were honestly just embarrassed after a while because they <laughs> swore you could hear the road at the bottom of thing yeah, but you know and, and and i have friends that say they'll never own one but um you know it the basics of keeping of not having a car payment of keeping our house payment low so that we had extra cash around to take care of the necessities to keep our lifestyle functioning and our kids 
I, our time with our kids was valuable. So we were able to, to do that. And um, at the same time, taking that, taking what would initially come, I remember the first day, my first, my first attending paycheck, I remember where I was standing <laughs> when I saw the number come across and I looked up at one of my colleagues who had been out in practice for 10 years. And I looked at him and I said, is this number real? <laughs> <laughs> um, it really? But you're so, you get so used to, you know, my, my husband and I were actually also in college together. So we remember the day, you know, we just tried to think about it. Are we going to buy a pizza tonight? Do we, do we, we can't go out tonight. We're just going to, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure we can afford a pizza. And then we shifted to residency. We were just used to not spending and living kind of a low key lifestyle. That was just our common practice. Yeah. And then shifting to that attending mindset of, oh my gosh, this is real, but I ha I've got to remember my long-term plan because I, if it's here sitting in my account, then it's going to get, it will get spent. So, right. you know, maxing out that retirement accounts, whatever that is, the children and finding the, the educational funds. Mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of that up front. That was just part of our makeup. So it really, we, did, we didn't really have the conversation because we were fortunate enough to come along from the same, we kind of came from the same mold, similar backgrounds. But I would imagine for those who didn't, you'd have to have that conversation up front, um, especially if you have, uh, if you've had previous careers mm -hmm. and there's an expectation from your spouse that all of a sudden you're making attending money and you should have more time, more cash on hand and be able to do more things. Like I, I would that's a conversation yeah. that would have to be had. And again, if I had a spouse who looked at me and said, you know, I married a doctor, I would think that I'd have to have you know, extra cash on hand. Where is all this going? And, yeah. and I had a different school of thought to that. That would, those would be challenging times. Yeah. Um, so again, finding common ground, I think is of, of what's important. And again, I'll have to give my husband credit for this. He told me early on, look, it's okay to spend the money to, to, to have the nannies, to, whatever it costs to keep us, comfortable and able to spend time with the kids and not doing the, not doing stuff that we just are too tired to do and, and missing out on opportunities with the children is, is worthwhile. So yeah, yeah that makes perfect to, sense. Say, he, he taught me how to, how to do that, but I will say I had the, the whole opposite experience with some of my friends. I think I mentioned this earlier. One of my best friends, when I came out of residency, she was an attending, she'd been out in practice, you know, 10, 15 years. Was it a whole, it didn't have children, how it had had a whole different, um, lifestyle in private practice before she came to the academic sector and um, had a whole different school of thought on spending. Yeah. Um, no, re no retirement account. Um, and I remember the first time we went to New York together where she took me to dinner, I thought, oh my gosh, I can't know. We, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to live this way. And so um, I would say probably to, if I were to give advice to anyone, it was just, you know, hide it from yourself where you can put it away because you'll need it later. And so now I sit 20 years into this, um, very comfortable in the fact that, you know, my children's college education is, is covered. Um, and my, my retirement account looks really good and I will never mm -hmm. stop funding it. No, I mean, I will be funding that retirement account until I stop clinical practice or stop practicing entirely. I think that's just the smart thing to do. And you got to look at your actuarial data too, especially if you're, if you're a woman, right, <laughs> most, right, of the women, yeah. most of the women in my family make it till they're 95. I yeah. think I've got a long way to go. And so it's only going to be higher 30 years from now or right, 30 or 50 right. years from now. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, and, and again, like I said, your career changes over time. So my, my colleagues who are mid fifties are practicing intraoperative anesthesia a little bit less than they were. And so as you, as you age up, I think you might, um, your career pivots a little bit right. and, and you have to adapt and you've got to be ready to adapt to that. So the time to put away and the time to save for retirement is the first five to 10 years of your career. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're preaching to the choir. So and totally, <laughs> totally agree. Uh, I'm curious, you know, you said that when you get that first paycheck, I, w I was thinking, did you do anything to celebrate when you saw that thing hit your checking account? No, okay. not at all. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I got a little nervous. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I did a podcast episode recently where I said, what I recommend when you, when you first start making attending money is uh, do something to celebrate that only costs you once. Nothing with a recurring payment. That's when you get into trouble. <laughs> Doesn't matter how much you spend, but as long as you can get it all, you know, with one shot, then uh, no, it's, I'm, prob I'm probably different than most. I had that. I had sort of this recurrent anxiety of the of the debt that I incurred from mm. going to school. I had to go out of state, and so and I didn't have any help funding my education early on. So um, I knew that I had that debt looming over my head, and I just I, my comfort zone was to have that disappear as quickly sure. as possible, pay that down, get rid of that, just so that I could breathe a little bit.
Yeah, so, uh, again, sense. maybe different from others, but um, I, I prefer to live in a, in a debt-free world if that's possible. And, and it, it served me well thus far. So Awesome. Totally. Uh, so we're coming up on the hour here, Angie. I want to uh, be sensitive to your schedule. Are you doing okay on time? Maybe we could take just like three to five more minutes. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm fine. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm sure there's some listeners out there who, you know, they're in residency or maybe they're early attending hood and they're really liking their academic medicine experience. They like working with trainees. They like using the cutting edge technology and doing the research and advancing the field. And they're looking at your career path and they think, I'd really like to emulate that. I'd like to grow my sphere of influence and my impact as a professional, as a physician, the way that Angie has. What kind of uh, advice, if you had to give like one or two things, like this is definitely something to think about, something to work on, something to push towards, if you're looking to build a successful career in academic medicine? Oh, gosh. Um, well, first off, you, you touched on this already, and that's find your passion. What are you passionate about? What interests you? What makes you excited to get up and go to work every day? Um, and I think you spend the first maybe five years figuring that out, unless you've done a fellowship and you happen to know early on. And I think surrounding yourself with people who have different talents that you can pull from, because we all have our weaknesses. And, and I think to do you, it's easy to capitalize on your strengths, but to develop your weaknesses will help tremendously. And then when there's opportunities that come available, say yes, yeah. say yes. And then if you don't know, say you don't know how and ask for help. Hmm. Never be afraid to ask for help when something is is not clear. It doesn't make sense. Maybe it's not a skill set you've been able to develop yet, but you want to. Um, find mentors, find coaches, find a sponsor. I think then again, knowing the difference between those three, those three, um, those three were not distinctly clear to me when I was coming along early. So I'd have people ask me, you know, who are your mentors? And and while I think back about it, I can think of, you know, my mentors, my sponsors, um, I had coaches along the way and who all were sort of a combined entity. Hmm. Um, but you pull from, we pull different, you develop different talents along the way from the people you're around. So again, being blessed in an academic medical center. And I think this is also true for those who are in the private sector. You can find a, a number of people who have different interests, different talents, different strengths, um, and then just not being afraid to ask for help. Um, so like you'll hear me talk about this pause, pivot, and adapt to career changes. But I think part of that is, like, again, finding and feeding your passions, um, uh, working on your weaknesses, amplifying your strengths, and, and finding um, ways to connect with both people in your institution and outside your institution. And in anesthesiology, we have, a, we have a tough time seeing beyond our immediate sphere mm -hmm. because we're in the intraoperative world. We know the hallways of the, of the OR. We know the, the hallways that lead to the OR. We right. know the, the, the holding room and the PACU. But beyond that, our scope sometimes is limited. And again, I think this is where it's helpful to, uh, when, when there's an opportunity for a project with, um, say, education, or there's an opportunity for collaboration across maybe service lines, or there's an opportunity for collaboration with a different, um, a, a different set of experts, say yes. Say yes and say, and again, recognizing that my, and if it's not within your area of expertise, be willing to grow. And I think having a growth mindset is probably the key to career success. Um, understand what you don't know. Be be okay saying, look, this is not with maybe may not be within my wheelhouse, but yes, I'd like to try. Um, is that too much? No, that <laughs> is, that, is that covering it all? Um, I've got this great one of my favorite books um, that I've I've was recommended to me one of my favorite authors. Um, Brene Brown wrote several. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of hers. Are you? I've, so I haven't read her books, but I've seen a couple of TED talks. Oh, Dare to Lead. The, the Power of Vulnerability. Yes, Dare to Lead and Daring Greatly. Yeah. Um, and she's got a lot of um, phenomenal um, just sound bites throughout all of those, whether it's podcasts, whether it's um, I, just listen to an audiobook, they're fantastic. And she just reminds people that sort of, you have to be courageous. Um, and again, <laughs> one of my favorite statements that she says, is sometimes you just have to embrace the suck, but tr hold true to your values. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, things are not always going to be easy. And it's not always going to be um, a straight path. But again, pause, pivot and adapt and, and see, how, see where it see where things go. Another one of my favorite authors. Um, and again, and this this one really hit home. Um, if you haven't read it, Grit by Angela Duckworth. Yeah, 
is yeah, she's here in Philly, I think at university. Yeah, of Pennsylvania. Fantastic. Um, and you know, I, if, if you think about this, you, you're getting ready to have your first, um, you know, how you establish grit in your children, how yeah. you establish grit in yourself. Um, she talks about, you know, talent and effort and skill. And I, I think this is applicable to careers because your career is, you know, and I, and I'm, again, here's my bias. I'm a little, uh, my perspective is a little different than others. And that as a, as a woman in medicine, um, my career path did not take a linear trajectory. It was more of a patchwork quilt, if you will, mm -hmm. little bits and pieces coming together that, that didn't, didn't have the same pattern, didn't have the same flavor at the same time. Um, but it's turned out to be quite, um, t quite an amazing project. So, you know, establishing, um, recognizing your talents and that it takes effort to develop a skill set. Yeah. While at the same time, you know, using the skill you have and putting in a little bit more effort is sort of the key to success. And again, that's all in, in Angela Duckworth's book. It's one of my favorites. Um, this grit, growth, resilience, inspiration, tenacity is what she talks about. Oh, I see so, what she did there. That was yeah, a clever acronym. Yeah. It isn't awesome. I know. I know. I just, I yeah, kinda, we'll link to that one in the show notes as well. I should, I should get, put that one on my list. You have to. That, that should be on your list. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Good recommendation. And again, cool. if you have... Oh. Let me, I'll give you one more too yeah. that you got to listen to. So, um, a podcast while we're at it, yeah. I'm going to give a shout out to Mark Shapiro, um, with explore the space. He has had some fantastic physicians and leaders in his, on his show. Um, it's at ET show. Um, I think he's probably got over 180 episodes now, but, okay. um, just for inspiration and something different to listen to that might just give you something to reflect on outside of the anesthesia world and, yeah. and finance. It's, it's, he's got some great stuff and great content. Awesome. Well, this is a great list of resources. I definitely want to link to all these in the show notes. So guys don't miss these anesthesia success.com slash 31. We're going to list all of Angie's favorite um, resources that she just listed here. And we want to get those into your hands. Um, so I want to, I want to bring it to a close here in a minute with, with this question, Angie, and this is something that I close with, with, with all my guests. When I can't. Uh, so yours is a very demanding profession. And with what you just described about grit, <laughs> perseverance <laughs> in the face of trial, I'm sure you've had those times in medicine and probably in parenting and probably in life. So I'm curious, tell us a, a, a brief story about a time when you had to really, you know, sacrifice, put it all on the line to work through a challenging season or a challenging situation. And then in that moment, you know, just reflecting like, this is like, I'm doing it. <laughs> it's working. This is something I'm grateful for. And this is uh, like, you know, the way to use your phrase, like living out your passion. This is something that you're really happy about. Oh, wow. I've got a couple. Um, they're personal and professional. There's, there's, a, there's a combined, and this may take more than just the last few minutes, but I'll quickly summarize. You know, at some point in my professional career, um, I had to rethink what I was doing. So locally, um, things changed. The culture changed the needs changed and I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to change, but the system was ready for me to change and had me change. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a challenge. That was a challenging time. I was unaware of why. And sometimes we look as physicians, we look for the why to solve the problem is to get to the next step. And there wasn't a why there was just change. And so to, again, to have to, to look at that and say, okay, what, what's next? Um, invested a lot of time, energy, effort, and emotion into one piece. And now it's time to pivot. Okay. I don't want to pivot. You know, I don't want to pivot. Um, right. So I had to think and, and re-strategize. And again, keep my eye to, to make the career sustainable. Keep my eye focused on what I was passionate about. Um, and I will say that going, um, you know, staying within my institution on projects, but then going outside with like-minded clinicians, people who were still passionate, who had had similar experiences. I can promise you, if, if there's something you're going through, someone else has already been through it. Yeah. Um, and it's just connecting with those folks to make it a sustainable phase and keeping your eye on the future and knowing that quite frankly, whatever it is, is temporary. So um, I had the, well, in the midst of all this, I had a uh, senior executive colleague say to me, um, I know it seems bad right now, but take a moment, realize this is just the now and get ready. And I thought, get ready, get ready for what? <laughs> um, but it was the get ready for 
where I am now. And so mm -hmm. where I am now, I can look back and say that was really a painful phase. But, you know, along the way, you find things that you're passionate about day to day, you have to find something, find joy in something, mm -hmm. find joy in the patients you take care of, find joy in the project you're working on, find joy in your family, find joy in recognizing that, quite frankly, you get to go out, get to leave the hospital every day. And we've you've invested a lot of time and a lot of effort in the education and you have a great job, um, a great career and a great profession. Um, and so those temporary phases, whether it's a one, two, three or five year block of time is temporary feed your passions and keep going. And so again, just keeping my eye on the future and, and realizing that um, there are, realizing what I find joy in, um, and I can add a little side to that. Now I find great joy in amplifying others. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of fun stuff along the way. I've got a lot to put on my CV, but now where it's fun is connecting other people who are interested in doing more, can't find a path and finding that path for them, opening that door and letting them walk through. Um, so that's kind of where I am now. And that's fun. Um, so again, it is, I guess, you know, along the way throughout those, you're going to have trials, tribulations mm -hmm. and challenging times, both personally and professionally. Yeah. Um, but again, a finding a network of people who are, who have been through something similar um, and learning from them and they're all out there. And I hate to, I hate to do it again, but there it is. They're out there on social media. You can yeah. connect with those folks. They're out there. Um, and, and, and again, locally and finding and keeping your, keeping your tribe close yeah. will get you through those tough times. Awesome. Well, that is absolutely excellent. Dr. Angela Edwards at Wake Forest University. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for joining us on the Anesthesia Success Podcast. That's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. This has been great. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to anesthesiasuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesiology and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I would also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on the Anesthesia Success Podcast.